Seven things that people who are good with money never buy. We'll see. We'll see. So this okay. is not our list. We're it's sharing list. a list. We found another list. We love going through this and seeing how we stack up. <laughs> I know. It's kind of like a quiz. Yeah. I want to know. I love taking all the quizzes. I know. Mm -hmm. So we're going to kind of look at each one of these, see how we're doing. You can judge for yourself, see how you're doing. We'll see if we are good with money or not. So who is saying whether we're good with money or not? I don't know. I'm not sure, but okay. we'll see. All right. So this is from an article in Medium. We will share the link in uh, the description below so you can check it out. Seven things people are good with money never buy. I like this Number picture. Number one. I want to go shopping with that girl, whoever she oh. is. Number one, they're not buying brand new cars. I feel like we talk about this nonstop. <laughs> yeah, this is like the number one thing we keep talking about. Probably, but... probably. Yeah, but no, we haven't bought a brand new car. We did buy our Honda Fit brand new. That is the new. only new car we bought, and that was a good purchase for us. Yeah, so. Uh... Which I think is interesting. Let's talk about that. Let's take yeah. that angle. Yeah, yeah. So a new car loses 10% of its value in the first month, 20% mm -hmm. uh, in the first year if you think about that thirty thousand dollar car that means it loses three thousand dollars in the first month and that would be what uh, about six thousand dollars in the first year of ownership so the value that you're losing is just flying off that vehicle so fast mm -hmm. versus if you buy a car that's three years old it's already lost a good chunk of that depreciation you're just saving yourself a lot of money by buying a used car now mm -hmm. the key is to hang on to it for longer you know the worst thing you can do is buy a new car and then trade it in two years later and just keep doing that. Because it's like all you're doing, you are the one who's eating all the depreciation and having to make up for it each time you buy a new car. So you want to be in the other extreme, on the other end. You don't have to go as crazy as I did buying, what was the Taurus? 13 oh, years old? <laughs> so this was a crazy experiment we did. And we talk about this in our book that's coming out in... March, March, I believe, oh. hopefully. But no, I bought a old Taurus off my sister. She was trading into a deal. I bought it for $1,000. Bought it as a third car that we didn't need at the yeah. time because it was just $1,000 and our other two cars are getting old. I'm like, this will be an insurance policy in case they blow up. One of them did blow up. So we drove that car for a few years, I think four years. And because it was so old and so far down in the depreciation curve, it just really wasn't depreciating anymore. And so I sold it for the same price I paid for it. <laughs> Five years later. He so how was cool is that? so happy with himself when that happened. <laughs> Pretty proud of myself. I'm not going to lie. I'm excited. Okay, but why did we buy? Let's answer the yeah. question. Why did we buy a brand new car? Like, so what was the reasoning for that? We bought in 2000 and what was that, 11? 2006. Fit? Really? 2006? That was a year after fit? our. It was our yeah, yeah, one-year yeah, anniversary yeah, yeah, yeah. trip, right. remember? And okay. our car blew up. So 2000, the end of 2006, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So 2006, we bought a Honda Fit. The reason we bought that purchase, I'm going way back here, I'm tapping into the archives, but <laughs> the reason we bought that car new was because, A, you couldn't buy it used. It was the first year that they had them in America. They were making them in Japan or something, somewhere over there. Yeah. Like, you could drive them in other parts of the world, but they didn't have them here. And if you remember, this was like the first time that gas, like went through the roof. It was the first time we hit $4 a gallon in the U.S. So everybody's freaking out about gas prices. I remember driving and paying 99 cents for gas or less, oh, yeah. 89 cents for gas. And mm -hmm. now it's like, we're really dating ourselves now. Yeah, we ended up buying this car new because we couldn't buy it used. I wanted to buy a Honda because I had done all the research and determined that Honda and Toyotas were basically the two best brands to buy in terms of reliability. Right. So the combination of all these things kind of made for the... All right, I'm going to break my own rule here and buy a new car. But mm -hmm. what I knew was we're going to drive this car for 10 years. Like I bought it yeah. with the intention of driving it for 10 years. I'm like, if we yeah, do we that, then we spread out the depreciation long enough that it might make it worth it. Mm -hmm. And we did. We drove it for basically about 10 years, right? Yeah, we really gave that car a lot of love. And it was a fantastic car. It like was I, a fantastic car. Ugly car. I mean, Super I mean ugly. I'm sorry it if you have like a fit and you think they look mini, good. A mini minivan is what it looked like. That's what we called yeah. it. And yeah. we have a minivan now, which is funny because we just upgraded too. Yeah. <laughs> or we people we added. Yeah. But it looked like a tiny minivan. It and did. we were like, this is such an ugly car. But man, it was like, it had way more space than you would think. Yeah. We had that car for 10 years and like nothing went wrong with it yeah. other than battery or uh, light bulbs. It burned yeah. through light bulbs pretty quick. But other than that, like nothing, like no repairs. It was amazing. I mean, to have a car for 10 years and basically have no repairs. Yeah. And like, then we sold it. And then we sold it for a good amount because it's a Honda and they sell well. Nice. That, that That's a real long story of not buying new cars. But that's the first kind of uh, point here. Don't buy a new car if you can avoid it. And if you do, hang on there for a while, okay? Okay. Next point. 
people who are good with money, according to this author, they're not leasing new cars either. Yes, I hate to break it to a lot of people, but you are not getting a deal if you are leasing a car. Now, I'm not saying there aren't reasons and times where maybe it you, makes sense. It might make some sense, but you just have to understand the financial benefit you're getting from it is not the reason that um, right. it makes sense. So I'll just leave it at that. And you can run the numbers and do all the math. Don't go to a dealer and talk to him about the numbers. Don't <laughs> don't go to somebody who's trying to sell you the right. lease and ask them for the numbers. But go look at, just Google it. Read the independent articles of people who actually run the numbers and then evaluate for yourself if that's the best financial move. Now, like we always say, all decisions are not financial decisions. Mm -hmm. So there might be other factors involved in why you're leasing it. Mm -hmm. And so we'll just leave it at that. No, but the, you bring up a good point because it is important who you ask what questions to. That is a really good point. Right? Like you can go to one person and hear what you want to hear, or you can go to another person and hear wisdom mm -hmm. and hear what the Bible says or what you need mm -hmm. to hear. You know what I mean? Yep. So just be careful who you're asking what questions to. All right, okay, number, number three, three in this list. They don't buy houses that they can't afford. Hmm. What do you think about that? I mean, I think that's very wise. I think that's a great idea. But yeah, the biggest reason is that you won't get it taken away from you by the bank. Right. Especially, again, post-2020, like, this is the thing that I feel like we keep talking about. Anything can happen. Like, I feel like we were just watching a show, and they're in the show, they're going to be talking about 2020. And Bob was like, go back to January, February of 2020. Imagine like how you would have thought about the next how year. How optimistic. <laughs> yeah, think about know. how optimistic we all were. Like this is the 20s, the roaring 20s, all the excitement. And then just a couple months in, there was a freaking quarantine. Like who saw that coming? Nobody. That, that was unbelievable. Yeah. And everything that's gone on since then. Anyway. I want to be like the anti-pandemic on this podcast. and I know. We don't want to talk about the pandemic the whole time or any of the conspiracy theories or any of that stuff. Let's talk about all of it. Let's bring what it out here. Let's talk about politics. Is, We're already talking about religion. It Let's was just do it. Just, it was just, it was very surprising and it put us in the position of, okay, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. The things that we didn't think were going to happen, happened. Yeah. Yeah. We were surprised by a lot of it. So, yeah. Okay. So the takeaway, I think, is life is unknown. We don't know what's going to happen. It's wise to prepare for things that could happen. Yeah. Let's just go back to Joseph in the Bible mm -hmm. in Genesis. God had given him a heads up, but like he prepared, he took steps. Right. In the times of abundance, he saw, you know, by God's heads up that there's a famine coming mm -hmm. and he got prepared for it. And as a result, not only did he survive it, but he was able to bless a whole bunch of other people and a whole bunch of other people were able right. to survive it because of his foresight. And I think there's a lesson here for us, you know, financially or in other areas of our lives. Like we should be paying attention to the signs. We should be paying attention to what's going on. And this doesn't mean we need to get all doomsday prepper and build a bunker and whatever else, but but let's just start thinking about what could be and what could be and like what are the hints? What are the things that uh, could be coming down the pike? And how should we adjust our lifestyle now? How should we adapt what we're doing now and thinking about the future, right? Yeah, and especially if you feel like you are having dreams or <laughs> things that God is highlighting to you, be paying attention, right? Exactly. Okay, but I have another question about this. How do you determine if you can afford a house or not? Because that's what this is saying. You don't buy a house that you can't afford. Because what I would love for everyone to do is to pay off their house and never have a mortgage again. I think that is a great goal I want you all to know that it's possible. We've done it. We didn't grow up in houses where our parents did that. So it's not like we came from all this money and we we're like, but what is a reasonable idea here of what can we afford? I know this, this <laughs> might be a cop out. I just don't like talking about this, but 28% of your income, you know, this is rough guidelines of what a lot of financial experts say should go towards mortgage expenses. So whatever, roughly a third of your income or ideally less mm -hmm. should be focused on that. I don't really like that because we've never operated on that. We've operated on pretty much as low as we can get by on. And this is the thing. This is where personal finance is personal because that mm -hmm. didn't mean getting the cheapest house we could possibly find because we could find things cheaper in right. parts of the 
area or city we didn't want to be in or that, that were, didn't make sense for our didn't family. make sense for us right. or were more dangerous or whatever but on the other hand it wasn't just where do we want to be it doesn't matter how much it costs we're just going to go there like our goal has always been how can we get a house that suits our needs for as little as possible so we can get it paid off as fast as possible the goal has always been how do we become mortgage free as fast as possible and that ratio is not going to help you get there. Now, the worst thing you can do is just go to the banker and ask him how much you can afford. Because even after the housing crisis of 2008, you would think that they would be, and they were a lot more cautious for a little bit, but still, they're always overestimating for you and I, in many cases. If you're an entrepreneur and new in business, they're hopefully underestimating. But that's not who you want to go ask how much you can afford. And that's what a lot of people do, unfortunately. And especially pre-2008, that's part of why we had the crisis that we had with the housing mess is because the banks were just lending way more money to people than they should have been. So again, who are you asking your questions to? Mm -hmm. Who are you asking what questions to, right? Yeah. But anyway, that's a rough, dirty answer to maybe give you a little bit more direction and point you in some direction with that. Okay, great. All right, number four on our list. They are not buying things on credit that they can't pay for. Okay. So in other words, if you're putting it on a credit card, it should be paid off every month. Yeah, I like that. Which yeah. we have. You've got to tell them about the Chase card. Oh, okay, let's talk about the Chase card. Let's we'll talk about it really fast since we are talking about credit. So the Chase card, yeah. So I, again, only talking to people who are... Um, paying off. Paying off a credit card every month. Mm -hmm. If you're not, just tune up for the next minute or two. It doesn't really matter. But yeah, so Chase Sapphire ultimately is our favorite credit card we've used. I've tried out... At this point, I think 34 different credit cards is how I roll is what I do. Fine with it. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so I tried out 34 different credit cards and this is just the best for most situations and ours being one of them. And so we've traveled for free, yeah, over a hundred hotel nights and flights and stuff. We've gotten completely free, mostly because of this card I and mean, the points that we've earned from it without going into all the details. A lot of these cards have points programs, but this particular points program just it's just better. It's just better. The money just goes further. The points just go further. So mm -hmm. it's like a currency that's worth more than other currencies, if that makes sense. So but all the, this to say. The reason why we're telling you about this is because right now they have like $100,000. Yeah, at the time of this recording. point yeah, bonus. There's a 100,000 point um, sign up bonus. So it's pretty Which crazy. Which most of our flights, mm -hmm. let's just put that in perspective. Most of our flights are probably under 20,000 points. Yeah. Yeah, so we were just we just booked my mom a flight up here, and I think it was like seven thousand, nine thousand points for her to fly from Florida to here. And so yeah, so hotels like some of the hotels we stay at are five thousand points a night. Depends on where they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. but the point is, is that those points go stuff. really, really far. So. Yeah. Anyway, there's the uh, sidebar on that. So I guess my takeaway, or my not my takeaway, but my encouragement is, if you just pick some random credit card because it's just what you've always had, or they give you a free T-shirt to shine up or something like. It might be time to try one that might yield you some more benefit. Mm -hmm. And if you're not using credit cards, that's cool too. Like, no need to use them. We had many years of our marriage where we didn't use them because they didn't make sense for us mm -hmm. and we couldn't control our spending. But right. if you are disciplined with your spending, you're paying them off every month, there's a lot of benefit and rewards that you could get. So, yes. anyway, all that to say, back to point number four you do not want to be paying for things. Yeah, you don't want to be buying a pair of shoes and be paying interest on it for 12 months. Like, we want to avoid that if else. at all possible. I think we all know this, right? This right. is pretty common sense. But, all right. Number five, they are not buying luxury goods from brand name designers. What do you think? Well, I mean, I have been for years trying to figure out how to convince you that this was a good idea. Because there are some things that <laughs> you can really, like, if you're going to do the, I'm going to buy this and then resell it. Like you've Give done me this an example. Before. Let's talk. Example. Like a Louis Vuitton purse. Do you There's think you one. can sell a Louis Vuitton? You can definitely sell a Louis Vuitton. You think you can Vuitton. sell it for half of what you would pay for? Oh, it? yeah. You think More so? than half. Yeah, and there are even some like super high-end luxury bags, at least, that you can sell for more. Okay, so here's what I As propose they, that like, we do. they become vintage and whatever. All right, here's what I propose that we do. We buy one used, a yeah. cool vintage one used. Okay. And then let's get a good deal on it when we buy it used. And then, yeah, let's oh, go for it. Are we doing this? Are we buying it with business money because it's an experiment for the business? <laughs> This is the other thing I do. If the IRS is watching, this should be real fun. 
<laughs> okay. So anyway, but in general, I agree with this. I mean, I think the point is... Okay. I would say, you know, and I don't know this world that well, but a lot of high-end design stuff is just so grossly overpriced. I agree. And there isn't a super strong secondary market where you can resell it. So anyway. No, I agree. And I think the point of this is you're just consuming. Like, I think yeah. that's what this point yeah. is, is the consuming aspect of it. So if you're going to do this, I think making wise decisions and trying to resell when you are no longer interested. Yeah. All right. Number six, they are less likely to load up on material items at all, opting for quality over quantity. So yeah, so I think it, there's a tendency to kind of look at these two and say that they're contradictory. They're, yeah. Uh, but they're not. I think you have cheap stuff, then you have quality stuff, and then you have whatever this Designer. is. This really high level. It's thing. really just an, a label. A yeah, name. and so even like if we're being honest about Louis Vuitton, for example, a saddleback leather bag that I used to have, that's made great. of this leather that's like this thick, like it really was super well leather. made, yeah. amazing quality stuff. It was expensive. It's like five hundred dollars for a bag, but that's actually still less than a Louis Vuitton. Yeah, and made a whole lot better. You know, Probably. for Louis, you're paying so much for the name, mm -hmm. and it might be well made compared to a coach bag or something like that. But I think the reality is it's probably not that much better than a coach bag. And maybe it's 50% better or something. I mean, I'm throwing these numbers out of thin air. But point is, it's not like whatever, 10 times or 100 times better, like the price would make you think. No, but I mean, this is true. So I, for a long time, shopped at H&M. I still like H&M. The sweatshirt actually is H&M. It's one of my favorites. But we bought some t-shirts from Freedom Co. Mm -hmm. Their quality is a whole lot better than H&M. You know, when you wash them, the seam isn't like sideways and stuff <laughs> like that. And they last a whole lot longer. So they are, really nice. they are more expensive. That brand is great. You should definitely check it out. But they're more expensive. However, it's something that you can have for like four, five, six years until yeah. it starts really wearing out. Whereas I can buy like six... H&M shirts, it's going to cost me the same thing, not as good of quality, yeah. and won't look as good. Well, yeah, and oftentimes, like, so in the case of Freedom Co., it's ethically made. Like, yeah. it's made, like, that's their main thing, is that it's ethically made clothing. Mm -hmm. And so, whereas a lot of things that are cheaper, in fact, most things that are cheap yeah. are not mm -hmm. made in sweatshops or whatever. But also, like, you think about that shirt, you said it's your favorite shirt to wear, and you mm -hmm. bought other t-shirts and worn them a few times and been like i'm ready to get rid of this that is a frustrating thing when you buy something that you love it in the store and then you get it home and it's like yeah it washes and it's terrible quality over quantity all right number seven on this list is they probably aren't planning lavish expensive weddings should we tell them about our wedding? i don't know man i think we <sighs> nailed it with this I, and part of it was just because this is what you wanted yeah, this was what we wanted. Well, and a part of, but like I, was I will tell I you, really care. a big piece of it was I was seeing how much everything was going to cost. I mm -hmm. went and tried on a dress, and I did not have money to buy a dress. This was like all happening to me at one time where it was like I was seeing how much things cost. I was seeing how in debt I was. We were getting married. We were trying to get our finances on track. So that was kind of the culmination of all these things that were happening at one time. And I went to go try on a wedding dress, and I was like, this is the dress. This is the one. It was beautiful. I felt gorgeous in it. You know, the whole thing. And it was going to be $1,000 to get this dress. And I still hadn't bought shoes or accessories. I hadn't gotten my hair $1, done or getting my makeup put on. compared to right. what a lot of people spend on dresses and now. In my head, I was like, <laughs> I cannot spend $1,000 on this. And so we ended up just deciding if we don't really want to spend that much money on this, like this is telling us something. Yeah. Right. So we went for a super simple wedding. We did immediate family only. I worked at my church at the time, so they let us get married in the building for free. We tried to pay our pastor. He gave us the money back, which was so kind and sweet. And we had a reception had at a, a nice restaurant in town afterwards. Well, our after, family. yeah, that was just with our family. And then my mom hosted a reception for us at her home a month later. It was really just so sweet and it was really intimate. Like we actually really loved it. Yeah. The best thing about it was the stress reduction of the yeah. entire wedding process. Because I had enough foresight to know, because I'm just analytically wired to think, all right, this is one day. Like we're going to be married this whole time. I'm more mm -hmm. interested in our 
the whole time married than I am this one single day. And I don't really want to spend whatever, $20,000 on this one single day, $20, but I would have happily done it. I would have happily done it for you. But Thank since you. you were kind of cool with this, I'm like, great, this yeah. is awesome. And so then we just had this super simple wedding, like almost all the stress was gone. And it's just it's like, so true. It actually became like this celebration of us being able to start our lives together instead of it being like this event. Yeah. Which I know that's not for everybody. But yeah, we're not putting this on everybody, but I'm saying for us, it was like, really great for this us. fit. And we really enjoyed it. And I, part of me, honestly, was scared that you might regret it at some point. I do not regret it at all. And yeah, and that's, all. that's awesome. It's a win. It's a win. We so, all win. And so yeah, and so we were able to actually have some money to buy a bed, which we desperately needed a bed, and many other things at the beginning of our marriage because we were completely broke. But yeah, it was a good financial move. One of the better decisions of our marriage mm -hmm. i think i agree so yeah so i think just remembering that it's one day is is helpful regardless of whether you're gonna do a big wedding or a small wedding because it's so easy to get caught up in the frenzy and in all the typical expenses yeah when and you, i have to do this yeah like you have to ask that question like do i really have to do this and the answer is not it's it's often different than you think mm -hmm. just because everybody else does it that way doesn't mean you have to do it that way and that's mm -hmm. such a liberating thing to understand and again also capping your spending limit on that like just saying okay we're only going to spend this much usually brings out so much more creativity yeah. it gives your friends and family a chance to participate in ways that brings you all together because mm -hmm. it's really such a special time of a new thing happening in your life and i think it gets overshadowed so often by the party and it has to be a, a certain way and I think it even can cause a lot of conflict because well I want it this way and well I'm paying for it so it should be this way well but it's my day so it should be this way you know yeah that that yeah. doesn't need to be there so yeah I think there's so much to think about with all of that and I think part of that can really be saving a lot of money yeah amen all right so those are the seven things that this author we don't even have author's name Bummer. Business Insider. Business Insider says people are good with money, never buy. So there mm -hmm. you go. All right. That's all for today. If you haven't liked this video or whatever, subscribe to the podcast or whatever the thing is, hit the like button, do all do that it. stuff. We love you. We want you part of the Seed Time family with us. And I don't know. That's all. See ya. <laughs>